everybody, welcome to Board Game Breakfast 21 for April 14th, 2014. Wow, 2014 is going by quickly. A couple of updates for the Dice Tower. First of all, our Kickstarter stuff is progressing. We're still getting all the things to send out for that. We're waiting on one more promo and the dice. Those are the two main things. For those of you who can't wait, we do have some of the Mage Wars promos uh, that um, are available. I've been had a lot of people ask questions about those. You can find out more about those on our website if you look under Donate. Well, folks, it's been a week. Uh, a lot of cool videos came up last week. You have a lot coming up this week. Let's get started, though, with the news. Mr. B Games has announced Spurs, which is a Western game where you go around, shoot em ups, all sorts of things that happen in the uh, glamorous Old West. Now, Space Cowboys, I just did a review of one of their games last week, Splendor, which is a great game, has announced a new game from Sebastian Bleasdale, uh, a great designer, uh, called Black Fleet. Now, this is a piratey type game, and it looks like it's a actual romantic, piratey, fun game. We can hope so. The artwork certainly looks good. Uh, the designer of Nations has announced a dice game version. That's the end thing to do. Make a popular game that takes a long time to play. Make a shorter version of it. Here we have a dice game. It's supposed to be 10 to 15 minutes per player. Fantasy Flight Game has announced Dungeon Quest Revised. Now, Dungeon Quest uh, was a game that came back way back when. Fantasy Flight reprinted it, and now they're redoing it again. It sounds like they're fixing the combat rules. Fantasy Flight for the Dungeon Quest managed to take some very simple rock, paper, scissors, dice rolling and make it into this very complicated card combat system, which really didn't add anything to the game. Dungeon Quest, of course, is the game where you're going to die, and apparently they're going to make it harder. Z-Man has announced Enigma, which is a one-to-four player puzzle tile-laying game. Cryptozoic has announced NHL Power Play team building game. I can't tell from the description whether this is a deck building game or not, although it is, in my opinion, that deck building was made for sports games, and I'm surprised people haven't tried it yet. It's supposed to have 200 plus cards. Uh, this week, the pack, or this past weekend, the PAX, the Penny Arcade Expo, uh, took place, and you know, a lot of things happened there. I didn't hear any new announcements, but I did know that the Settlers, uh, the, the Catan World Championship happened there with 115 people. The winner goes to Origin, or it might have been a regional championship. I'm not sure, but I know that there was 115 people who played. Griggling Games has announced a new space game, Destination Neptune. And Stronghold Games is going to be picking up Among the Stars. Now, if you watched our uh, top 10 list this week of games that murdered other games, you'll see that I said Among the Stars is a great game, and for me, with the expansion, replaces Seven Wonders. Now, it might be confusing that there's a Kickstarter going on right now for Among the Stars, but the Kickstarter is mostly for the European uh, version of the game. It's better if, if you live in America, it'd be better for you to go to Stronghold and pre-order it, and you'll get it then. And so we're looking forward to seeing that. I, well, at least I am, because it is a fantastic fantastic game among the stars. Then the Origins Awards Committee has announced the nominations for the different categories for the Origins Awards. Now, a couple things here. First of all, I am on the board game committee. There's many different committees. Each committee has five different people, and I am one of the people on the board game committee. Just because I'm on the committee does not always mean I agree with the final choices. I am only one out of five people to make these. Um, also, I have a lot of insight in the process, and while I've criticized Origins Awards greatly in the past, uh, very much so, they, the process is getting better. What they're doing now is they, are, they have skipped some of the steps. The way it used to work was the nominations uh, would be made by a committee. The committee would we get together and we'd make 10 games. We'd send those to uh, the Gamma Trade Show where the retailers would vote those 10 games down to five games. I was never really happy with that step because the retailers will tend to vote on games that sell well and also retailers might be good at selling games but necessarily aren't really good at, oh, not always, good at knowing which games are the best. And that was kind of proven evident. Then the games went to Origins Game Fair, where everybody voted on them, and the game that had the most recognition, like for example the Doctor Who card game, while it wasn't even that popular of a card game, had the words Doctor Who on it, so obviously won. Now what they're doing is we have a five-person committee, we are making a list of five games, we're skipping the retailer step, and when instead of the public voting on the awards, there will be two awards. There will be the public votes on them, and that's like the general public appreciation award, but then the, the, all the different committees will vote on the different awards, saying which ones, uh, voting for these games. So... 
That being said, there's lots of different categories, but there's four that concern my audience. Uh, for the board game category, which I was part of, the five games are Trains, Time and Space, Space Cadets Dice Duels, Crossmaster Arena, and City of Iron. Uh, for me, my pick there, of course, would be City of Iron as the best of those, although Space Cadets Dice Tools is also a game I like quite a bit, and Crossmasters, and Trains. Time and Space is the only one I was like, eh, on. For historical games, SOS Titanic, Navajo, Freedom, the Underground Railroad, 1775 Rebellion, and Francis Drake. I haven't played Navajo, but the other four games are quite good. And for the Children Family Party Game, they really need to change the name of this category, but anyway... Walk the Plank, The Three Little Pigs, My Happy Farm, ROFL, and Choose One. Five excellent choices. And then for card game, Love Letter, the DC Comics deck building game, Boss Monster, Clubs, and Marvel Legendary Dark City. So while these picks, I'm, no, no one's going to agree with them, obviously. It's it never, I would say that this is a much, much, much better slate of games that Origins Award has produced than in any other year. It has been a dead week here. Not a lot has come out last week. The biggest game that was released last week was probably Myth, which was released to great fanfare and great gnashing of teeth about the rules involved with that game. Uh, but hopefully they will be making a better set of rules available online. Fairy Tale, the new revised edition came out. I saw it, looks really nice. And a game called Personally Incorrect, which is trying to ride the wave of how far can we push the envelope in being offensive type games, which obviously did very well for Cards Against Humanity, and now a bunch of other people are trying to jump into the same boat. Uh, what's coming out this coming week? Man, the only thing I can tell you that I know is coming out this week is the, the new attack wing ships with, that include the Voyager and the Borg Sphere. Other than that, not sure. Some of the games publishers are kind of uh, juggling at this point. They want to wait till Origins for some of them or Gen Con for other ones, but some might be released early, so keep an eye out for that. All right, to the professor. <laughs> everyone, this is Scott Nicholson and welcome to the Ivory Dice Tower where I'm talking about my recipe for meaningful gamification. These are six things that you can use other than rewards and points to help people engage with something in the real world. Today I'm going to talk about R for reflection. Now reflection is the idea of thinking about what you've done. Dewey, who is a learning theorist, said that we only learn after we do something and we reflect upon that thing. That if we don't reflect upon what we did, we don't learn. Reflection is key. If you want to help people actually make changes, long-term changes, they need to be able to reflect upon what it is that they've just done. In games, when we have a board gaming session, this actually can happen afterwards. And, and you know, if you have had a time where when the game finished, you all talked about what happened, it actually adds quite a bit to your enjoyment and understanding of the game. As compared to, all right, we finished the game, close the box, what's next? and you're immediately moving on to the next thing, I would encourage you to take a minute after you finish a game and say, hey, let's talk about what happened there. I'd like to unpack it a little bit to help understand what was going on. You know, what were you thinking when you made these decisions? Why did you win? What were the choices you made? I didn't understand this thing. Because talking about a game after it's over can really help you understand what was going on in that game that you didn't see as a player. As a player, you have a very narrow perspective that you're gonna see one part of the world, you're gonna see your thing, and it can be hard for you to understand why people are doing what they're doing. Now, sometimes those answers will be, why'd you do that? I don't know. You know, they don't have it, and that's fine too. But talking about games after you finish them, reflecting upon them, can help you not only understand more about the game, but understand more about the people that you're playing the game with and help you understand what sort of things drive them about games. Because when I sit down to play games, I see myself as a facilitator of a game experience, that I'm trying to help everyone to have an enjoyable experience. And part of doing that is getting to know those people, getting to know their tastes, getting to know what they enjoy. And the only way I get to know that really is getting them to talk about a game after we've finished. So I'm gonna encourage you to use reflection, and, and reflection works in many situations. After you've seen a movie, one of the fun things about seeing a movie is talking about it afterwards. After you ride a ride at a theme park, when you're by yourself, you don't have anyone to reflect with. So you can be all crazy and shaking because you just did 17 inversions, but if you have people to talk about that with, it helps you to reflect, reflect about what's going on. And this is why when we play these games, having someone to reflect about what's happening with can make it a much more enjoyable experience and can actually help motivate you to figure out 
what else you might want to do. And you can use this in the real world as well. In game design, we call this actually a postmortem, where at, they do these postmortems after a video game comes out and the whole design team comes together and talks about, all right, what went right, what went wrong, how did this happen, what can we learn from it? So let me encourage you, add a few moments to each game experience and reflect upon what went on with the people that you're playing with. You'll learn more about the games, more about them, and more about yourself. Until later, I'll talk to you then. Just like last week, my uh, stable of reviewers has a pile of games for you. I hope to get several of these done. I will likely get probably every game that you can see here reviewed. Also, I have Mr. Card Game, and there's other games. And we're playing games as fast as we can here so that we can get them reviewed and talked about. So you can look forward to these. And there's other videos. Check out the Dice Tower itself, all of our podcasts on DiceTowerNetwork.com. If you missed it, last week we had a very, very rowdy Dice Tower showdown about the collectible card games and micro games. And again, you can find all that at DiceTowerNetwork.com. Hi, I'm Cassandra, and in this episode of Inside Out, we're going to be taking a look at Takenoko. Real book's neat because it has this comic book. Here is an example of some of the green tiles. Here's an example of some yellow tiles. Here's an example of the pink tiles. So these tiles are just in the box, and I think they're just for... Um, Looks. Here's an example of the three types of improvement tiles. Here are the three different types of cards you can play. These are three examples of the panda cards. Here are three examples of the gardener cards. Here are three examples of the garden cards. Here's the emperor bonus card. Here are the player boards. They are identical except the icons where you put your tokens. Here are the wooden action tiles. Here are the action tokens that match the player board. Here are three examples of the irrigation tiles. Here's an irrigation on the board. Here are the bamboo pieces in pink and this is how they stack easily by just placing one on top. Here are the green bamboo pieces. Here are the yellow bamboo pieces. Here's the weather die. So here's the big chubby panda. I think the panda piece is really cute. Here's his backside. Here's the grouchy gardener. He doesn't like the panda eating his bamboo. <laughs> Hi there, welcome to the Board Game Nights. I'm Christoph Schrader. And I'm Sam Gillespie, and today we're doing an introduction to deck building as a mechanic in board games. So, what is a deck building game? Essentially, in a deck building game, every player will start with a small, thin pack of cards they will then use to purchase other cards. This is to build a well oiled machine of a deck, which they then use to fill out the victory conditions of the particular game. Collectible card games like Magic the Gathering often feature preemptively building a deck to compete against other players. Deck building games, however, turn this little aspect of a CCG into a game itself. Close. So what makes deck builders good? Well, there's three main points. One, variety. At every stage of the game, there are so many different decisions you can make. Two, strategy. Every decision you make is incredibly important, and you also need to consider the impacts of luck on that. And three, replayability. Every time you play, the optimum strategy is going to change, and how you play that round is going to be different every single time. Essentially, you're trying to make the best of what you've got at the time in your hand and then trying to set it up so that you make the best of your next hand as well. This gameplay mechanic is more adaptive, and it's essentially trying to build a machine that will best exploit the luck inherent in the mechanic. Deck building is being used to help make other games more interesting. So for instance, A Few Weeks of Snow is a war game that's made much more interesting by adding a layer of frustration with this deck building mechanic. Trains, an area control game where you're trying to build a rail network across Japan, is made a bit more intriguing by adding a deck building layer on top of that. And finally, uh, deck building games do not have to feature cards. Quarriers uses dice, and these games are called pool building games. One final note, a big criticism of deck builders is that they can be quite frustrating, as all it takes is one bad hand to completely ruin your strategy. Indeed. That wraps up our introduction to deck building as a mechanic in board games. Enjoy the rest of your board game breakfast.
some weeks I'm going to go over different components of games because they don't necessarily merit a full review of the Dice Tower, but I can stick them in here in Board Game Breakfast. These dice that you're looking at here are actually being kickstarted right now from Custom Game Lab, where they're kickstarting basically a way to make custom dice for games. And you can see the dice here. Now, the dice here, I would say, are... I would give them a 7 out of 10. They're, they're probably not as nice as Chess X Dice, for example, which are, for me, a 10 out of 10. But at the same time, you can get these custom made. And so if you're looking to get custom dice, and I'm sure there's a lot of wannabe game designers, or perhaps you want to get uh, specific dice for a different game, these might interest you. They roll pretty well. Uh, the designs are, for the most part, pretty clean and easy to see. And it shows that they can even do little stuff, like the little number on this die. So anyway, that's Custom Game Labs. Then we have some dice from Crit Ceramics, or Crit Hit Ceramics, I'm sorry. These are ceramic dice, okay? And they look and feel really well. But, you say, Vassal, what is this little white thing here? Well, that's because, folks, one of the dice that I got was a little chipped. So I dropped the dice from uh, waist height onto a tile floor. And you can see that the six-sided, the ten-sided, the four-sided, all got um, basically pieces chipped off of them. So these are great dice if you're going to play with them and you're careful and you have a rug and you probably won't drop them on any hard four. But if you have kids or you have somebody who rolls dice where they go on and there's a hard four nearby, then these dice are probably not the best that you can do. Ceramic, they feel cool. They're neat to throw around. I'm not sure it's the best material to make dice out of, but if you're interested in these, the website will be coming up in a few weeks, I think. Crit Hit Ceramic Dice. Hi, Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. One of my favorite games is San Juan, which is unfortunately out of print and getting pretty hard to find. But if you're lucky enough to own an iOS device, there's a great app version you can check out instead. A sibling game to the seminal Euro, Puerto Rico, San Juan pits you against other players to develop its beautiful capital city. With elements of role selection and tableau building, San Juan is also a precursor to the popular race for the galaxy in the way that it uses cards for both the city building and the currency to purchase the buildings. This makes for a really compact game experience on both the tabletop and within your device. The San Juan app has all the essential features you expect, but not a lot of bells and whistles. The tutorial is strong enough to teach you how to play the game, the rules are clear, and there's a full role and building index. There is online play using Game Center, but you'll need to plan ahead with a friend because you're not going to have much luck picking up a random game anymore. The interface is intuitive, and there are multiple AI levels for solo play, and they're pretty good. The app normally sells for $4.99, but it does go on sale every few months, so keep an eye out for that. There is also an unofficial app for Android called Condado, which I'm not including because it's not an official port, but it does get really strong reviews. San Juan is easy to learn, quick to play, and really pretty fun. It does get samey over time, and it's not a big brain burner. But the game's simplicity and quickness make for a great gateway game and ideal for mobile gaming. Give it a try. Hello again, Internet. Uh, so today we're going to talk about a particular theme of game as opposed to a type of game. And that theme is pirates. So I uh, dressed appropriately with my awesome pirate shirt. There are lots of different pirate games out there. I think there's more pirate games than there are zombie games. And they run the gamut in quality and complexity. Starting out at the bottom, we have Days of Wonders Disappointing Pirate's Cove. And, of course, yeah, whatever. Now, the advantage of this is it does come with six kind of cute pewter figurines, which are worth taking a look at if you want to make a pirate-themed charm bracelet. Then at the other end of the scale, we have award-winning pirate games, like Stefan Dora's Buccaneer, or in the original German, Sea Rauber. And Habba's fantastic kids game, Der Schwarze Piraten, or Black Pirate. Now, pirate games come in all levels of complexity as well as quality. So there are some very simple kids games that you can play if you're into pirates, like Alice Canone. A fabulous little memory game for kids of all ages. Or Scallywags. 
great little coin collecting, stick it to your friends kind of game. And Captini Ya Pilsihiri. And I'm sure our Finnish viewers are laughing their butts off at my pronunciation of that word. So it's full of adorable little figurines that you should really check out if you're ever, oh, I don't know, in Finland. One Hit Wonders is where I talk about different games that were on my top 100 list for only one year, then they fell off. Now, almost invariably, I still really like the games, and they came off for different reasons. Well, today we're going to talk about a game called Starfarers of Catan. Now, Starfarers of Catan, I was fortunate to play uh, almost immediately after it came out, and almost immediately after I played Settlers of Catan. I played them back-to-back, -back, essentially, when I first was getting into the Euro game scene. Starfarers of Catan is done by Klaus Teuber, and it is a game that takes Settlers of Catan, which most people know, and moves it into space. But instead of just uh, being in space, you actually had to move spaceships around the board and discover new places to put colonies, and you'd build more spaceships and have them travel around. And it came with a giant spaceship that you would shake each turn and turn upside down, and little colored balls would fall out, which would tell you how far you would move that turn, and also also, um, basically, if an, a special event would happen, when you might run into pirates and so, all sorts of things. The spaceship also was able to be upgraded with guns and with extra engines and with booster rings that would allow you to carry more cargo, to fight off pirates better, to move farther on the board. It's a grandiose game with fabulous components, even though the first edition ships broke very easily and lots of people had to get replacement ships to fix them. The game is a very fun game, and I still like it quite a bit. In fact, Sam Healy likes it even more than me, and he's constantly praising it and talking about it. I like Starfarers of Catan, but the reason it fell off my top 100 is because it's really just a little long for what it is. I like it, but sometimes it can take two and a half, even up to, if you're playing with people who think for a while, three hours, which is really long for, basically, Settlers of Catan in space. Fantastic components. It's a very enjoyable mechanism, and I think it was the best of the uh, the Settlers of Catan spinoffs in the in like for a five year period. And it just had this really neat idea, and I love space, so I still like the game, and I still would play it. The expansion allows five to six players. I think you're better off just sticking with four. Although some of the aliens and things that the expansion added were really cool. It's a visual treat to look at this game. It is a lot of fun, and I still like it quite a bit. But it's that length for what the game was that knocked it down a little bit and why it's no longer in my top 100. All right, we're getting close to the end here. Let's talk a little bit more about building your game group. Hello there, Dice Tower viewers. Chaz Marler from the Pair of Dice Paradise board game podcast here, welcoming you to part five of my hopelessly misnumbered two-part series on running a gaming group. Today, I want to share the first question that I've received in response to these segments, which is pretty darn cool. Jarb2014 Rowan asked, Do you have any ideas for including non-English speakers in a gaming group? Making games easier for them? How to interest them? Etc. Ooh. Well, my first suggestion is to reduce the language barrier. Try to find games that don't contain a lot of text. Some games do a really good job of using icons to communicate ideas, which is good because even I have a hard enough time with English, and even then, mastered it I still completely haven't yet. My second suggestion is to reduce the complexity barrier. Can you imagine how difficult it would be learning a game in your non-native tongue? I imagine it'd be pretty brutal. So that's why I'd recommend games with mechanisms that are as simple and universal as possible. Now, this doesn't mean it has to be a children's game, but more like a game with a straightforward objective, instead of multiple rules and exceptions to those rules. Now, I looked through my game collection to find ones that I thought might meet these criteria, and here's what I came up with. Blockus, Cartagena, For Sale, Get Bit, Hey, That's My Fish, Ink and Gold, No Thanks, Straw, Ticket to Ride, and Zombie Dice. To be honest, I don't even think it's that good of a list. So help me out here, Dice Tower community. What's your top, I don't know, 
Top 10 list of games that you'd use to introduce non-native language speakers to board games? I'd love to see your top 10 list, from A to Z. So, I hope this helps with your multi-language mingle. And until next time, estoy deciendo algo a Sierra de los Juegos de Mesa. Hey folks, today I want to talk about hating on games. Well, not hating on games, but uh, one of the things as a reviewer, there's constantly, the, it, being a reviewer is a very interesting thing sometimes, especially in the board game industry, because you get to know the game designers, you get to know the game publishers, and if you criticize someone's game very harshly, the chance of you running into that person is pretty high. So that's an interesting thing. But more interesting than that is, many times when you criticize a game, it feels like you are criticizing everyone who likes that game. And I think a good reviewer should not do such a thing. In fact, I hardly ever see reviewers do that. You know, it's one thing if I pull out a game, let's say I pull out Dice Town here, and I say Dice Town is a terrible game, and if you like it, there's something wrong with you. Well, I don't believe I've ever said that in a review, and I would hope not, and, and it's not implied or anything, but people tend to take it that way. So many times when somebody will make a negative review of people's favorite games, they will jump on it. Now, granted, there's the opposite effect where someone will do a negative review of a game. People come in and say, well, maybe you missed this part. Other people come in, oh, the fanboy showed up, and there's just lots of debate. I love debate. I think debate should be reason, but debate should never be, in an instance, against a person. So, for example, if I say, if you, you know, if you don't, if you like this, there's something wrong with you, just as much as if you don't like this, there's something wrong with you. We might make such statements occasionally on the Dice Tower in a joking way, but we certainly never mean them. What brought this to my mind last week was Ryan Metzler did a review of Jamaica here on the Dice Tower, which has garnered a huge amount of down thumbs, which is mind-boggling to me, because Ryan hated the game, did not like Jamaica at all, and knowing Ryan and his taste in games, that makes perfect sense. Now, we love Jamaica. Obviously, I've talked about it quite a bit in the show. The Miami Dice folks, we, we talk about it in a, quite a few of our top 10 lists that we do. But just because Ryan did not like the game doesn't mean his viewpoint is wrong, and he's not saying people who like Jamaica are, are dense or dumb or stupid. That, that doesn't, that, so I think as viewers, and this includes me because I view other people's videos, we have to be very careful when someone reviews a game, especially negatively, that we like a lot, to not look down on that person. Just because they don't like the same things that we do doesn't mean that we have to have this disharmony. I love iced tea. Iced tea is delicious. It should be served with every meal. Sweet tea, of course. Uh, and I think it's fantastic. My wife hates iced tea. Now, I actually think this is a good thing because when I buy a gallon of iced tea, I can drink it all myself. Well, all my kids like iced tea now, so, so much for that. But I, we don't have a huge thing over who likes what. That would be silly to do that. It's just as silly to do that in games. Sometimes when I, I go to some place and I'll see someone playing a game that I don't like, and I've said quite strongly in my review I don't like it, they're almost like ashamed. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm playing this game. And, and I'm like, no, let it, let it go. Play the game. Just because I don't like the game, if you like that game, have a blast playing it. Have fun. DC Deck Building. Every time I see people playing it, oh, I'm sorry, Tom. No, play the game. Have fun. You know, it's a, if you love playing that game, that's fantastic. So I ask people, not just on my, our reviews, and if you want to down thumb mine all you want, go right ahead. <laughs> but like, for example, Ryan didn't like Jamaica. It was pretty brutal towards it. That is his prerogative. I disagree with him. He's wrong, but he's right to say his opinion. And he should take criticism for his opinion alone. Now, you can go in there and argue and say, Ryan, this really is a great game, blah, 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 blah. And, but I think we should be careful sometimes about defending our games and realize that when someone attacks a game, they're not attacking the people who enjoy that game. Well, at least for the most part. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Time for 60 seconds. Village, a life and death worker placement game for two to four players. You have a generation one family on your farm. On your turn, you take a cube from an area to activate that part of the village. You can place a member of your family on a section of the board. For example, he can become a worker in the building that makes wagons. When placed, two time is spent, and each time you have him work in the future, two more time is spent for the wagon. Someone can go traveling, spending a time and a wagon and a resource cube to visit other villages. The more you visit, the more points at the end. Get a new member for the family, leading into future generations. Go to the market to trade for victory points. You can work in the city hall or into the church as monks. They get put into a black bag, and at the end of the round, you hope they'll get chosen to enter the church. You can spend the gold to make sure they enter.
as time is spent, whenever the bridge is crossed, someone in the lowest generation loses their life. Depending on where they are on the board, they are put into the village chronicles for scoring at the end of the game. If the section is full, then they get buried in the anonymous grave, scoring no points. When either section is completely full, the game ends. Add up the victory points from around the board, most points wins. A beautiful game. The way the cubes work is brilliant. Great couples game with an attractive theme out of five we give this game a... Five. Hello chaps and chappies. Today I'm going to be looking at Parcheesi, a game about painting... Sorry? Melody is mastiche. Pasteurized. Pasteurized? No. No, pastiche. Pastrami. No. In the game, you're mixing paints to create colours to recreate some of the world's greatest masterpieces. Now think about it for a sec. Yes, there's something about it which is not quite right. So essentially this game is about painting paintings that have already famously been painted by famous painters to get points. Why? Let me hear you say why, come on. So as theme goes, it's pretty kind of... But think about it. The only person that would recreate a masterpiece is a forger. So why couldn't the game be about forgers forging paintings that have been painted by famous painters to get foreign French francs? That would be fun. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun if you took the elements from masterpiece, where you have forgeries and real paintings, and you had to try and sell them to get as much money as possible? Wouldn't that be great? A fun element in a game for me is making money, not points. And also another fun element is being naughty, not being nice and blasé. So if you like a game which is thin on theme but heavy on mechanics, then maybe you should pick up Ishtip Sup, the game my wife likes beating me at. And that's it for this time, folks. Don't forget, if you want just the audio version of this and some of our other videos, you can go to DicetowerAudio.com. There's piles of videos coming out this week. We're starting to work on the Dice Tower Award nominations. You should see them shortly. Uh, we're going to be starting to work on our videos for people who are new to the hobby. That was one of our Kickstarter goals. And the Kickstarter is chugging along. Stuff will be coming uh, hopefully within a month. So anyhow... Until next time, my name's Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. To find out more about all of our podcasts, check out Dicetowernetwork.com. To see a listing of our videos, head to Dicetower.com. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Cool Stuff Incorporated, where you can buy games for great prices. Cool Stuff in Stock. Do you want to play a board game? It doesn't have to be a board game.